call our meeting to order. And the first thing we're going to do is establish a quorum um, by a roll call. So I will start to my right. Hello, Joseph Federico, industry member. Holly Cornes. <laughs> <laughs> industry member, excuse me. Coco the Shame, public member. Dr. Carrie Williams, industry member. Um. Dr. Carrie Williams, industry member. Lisa Tong, public member. Steve Weeks, public member. Jackie, Jackie Crabtree. Jackie Crabtree, industry member. <laughs> Andrew Drafton, public member. Okay, so we have established a quorum. The next item on our agenda are my opening remarks. And so today I am not sad, but happy and sad at the same time. We have a couple of special um, individuals who today is their last meeting. And the first individual that we would like to honor today is Miss Tammy Guest. This is her last board meeting. I personally just want to really, really thank you. I'm really, really going to miss you. I was. Um, I started the board about maybe five, six years ago. I feel like I've been on the board for a really long time. But what I do remember, Tammy, is that you have just always been there to really support me. I remember I was really nervous for my first time and just the way that you've worked side by side, all the hard work, dedication, and sacrifice you've given to the board, you make us look really good. You, make, you have made me look really, really good. And so I'm really gonna miss you, but I'm also really excited for all that you have ahead of you and I really hope that we can keep in touch and that you'll check in with us and we'll hear from you and then maybe I'll see you in some country around the world. <laughs> we can meet in a, in a country around the world but you're really, really a beautiful person and I appreciate all of your service and dedication to us as a board and to the state of California and all of the licensees. And so we have a special presentation for you today. <laughs> um, not only do the board members, we have a special card for you but we also um, have a resolution for you. I'm going to read it into the record. Whereas Tammy Guest, board project manager, will retire after over 10 years of outstanding and commendable service to the state of California and the board of barbering and cosmetology. And whereas throughout her many years of service, Tammy has served the people of this state with fairness, compassion, dedication, and a willingness to help and volunteer, she has earned the respect and admiration of management and coworkers for her knowledge and personal attention. She will be missed by all. Therefore be it resolved that I, Dr. Carrie Williams, on behalf of the members of the board, does hereby extend to Tammy our sincere and grateful appreciation for her outstanding record of personal and professional achievements and for her dedicated service to the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology, to the state of California, and to the state of California. Our congratulations on her well-earned retirement and our best wishes to her and her family for continued success, happiness, and good health in the years to come. And be it further resolved that a suitably prepared copy of this resolution be presented to Tammy Guest. so much we're really really going to miss you and we have another just your itinerary also if we have to reach you. <laughs> any questions we got we right. <laughs> so another member of our board today is their last day and that is Coco Lachine and I just really want to say I just really appreciate you and the relationship we've been able to develop while working here on the board I'm really going to miss working side by side with you in DRC you have really, really taught me a lot. I appreciate all of the 
um, suggestions, all of the hard work, all of the sacrifice you have given, and just your point of view has always just opened my eyes with your creative background and all of the notes that you've given us in the board meeting to just help us be a really, really well-rounded board where we can remember to be very inclusive. And I just really, really appreciate all of the hard work that you've given us as a public member on this board. And so as a board, we have a little gift for you as well. <laughs> and also I have a resolution that I would like to read into the record for you. Honoring Coco Lachine upon the ending of his term as a board member, whereas Coco Lachine has been a public member for the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology for more than two years, and whereas Coco will, while on the board, has served on the following committees, disciplinary review and education and outreach, and whereas Coco has earned the trust, respect, and friendship of all who have worked with him, now therefore be it resolved that I, Dr. Kerry Williams, on behalf of the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology, does hereby honor Coco for his years of public par participation, thanking him for his tireless efforts on behalf of not only the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology, but also the state of California, and extends best wishes best wishes for success and fulfillment in all his endeavors, and be it further resolved that a suitably prepared copy of this resolution be presented to Coco Lachine. I'm going to end my remarks. I'm going to allow um, Coco, and then if any of the board members after Coco um, gives his remarks would like to say something as well, you may do so. Good morning. Um, for those of you that are particular about use, use of pronouns and the citation actually did use the word he, that's quite okay with me because this is the first time I'm actually making an appearance at this board meeting uh, in this persona. So uh, I'm okay with either he, they, it's all cool for me, so thank you. Um, when I was first appointed to this board by then Speaker of the House, Tony Atkins, who is now President of the uh, Senate, I thought, oh my God, it's glamorous, it's gonna be fun, <laughs> until I got the board packet for the first time, <laughs> including the, the old Sunset Report, which is probably around this thick as well. And so I said to myself that, you know, I haven't even started yet, they're already intimidating me. Uh, but it has been a wild ride. Uh, I'm going on my fourth year, my term is ending, and the reason I'm leaving is not because I wanted to leave this board, but mostly because I'm moving full-time back to New York, which was where I was originally from. Uh, so I do want to uh, you know, thank this uh, staff. You have been so good to me and patient in educating me. When I started, I didn't know what the, what the hell a sand band is or a quad is. Uh, and Joe and everyone else have helped me understood some of uh, the terms and I hopefully have learned uh, and be a part of this uh, board in a uh, fruitful way. Uh, to this board, you have been very supportive of me, old and new, uh, and thank you for uh, welcoming me to this industry because I came from the public. These days when I go to a salon or a, or a nail place, uh, my perspective is completely different. So, uh, the, uh, to the staff, uh, to, to the public, I've met many of you, and uh, thank you for your input. You have really taught me a lot about the industry, things that I never thought that I would learn. And uh, uh, Fred Jones, <laughs> you're the first person who came up to me and welcomed me, and I appreciate that. And you have left an indelible mark in me forever. I will always remember you with two words, unintended consequences. <laughs> um, my time here has been really fun, especially with DRC. Uh, it's given me a new perspective in life, and you know, I'm someone who is always willing to learn. Having sat on DRC uh, for the past almost three years, I've learned to be more fair, be more patient, and uh, 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 Richard had taught me that it's also a good time to educate and inspire. And hopefully we're not here at the RC to just uh, be punitive, but also to encourage our industry and especially inspire uh, the young people who are just coming in the apprentices and to the immigrants, uh, to the immigrant population of our uh, industry 
uh, that when they hear the word state board, it doesn't mean run. Uh, <laughs> So thank you so much for this time. I'll be here for the rest of the week uh, to finish my work here. And just to say uh, last word, today's the last day to register to vote. Please do so. Ask your friends to register and please vote. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Coco. And if any of um, my fellow board members have any remarks, um, you can please share. I would like to say something. Um, last week, I had the uh, privilege of attending a meeting in Sacramento with uh, our DRC staff in regards to updating kind of the way we handle uh, the files in the DRC rather than uh, going more of a paperless option, I would say. Um, for everybody who's attended DRC, they'll understand that basically by the time you finished your days of hearing, you have boxes of paper that just basically go to the shredder. And so we are looking at kind of a, um, at a, we had an IT team come in and look at like a, a Dropbox style device that we would able to be able to view all of our DRC, uh, DRC cases through. Um, I, the only thing, the only recommendation that I can make is uh, kind of uh, echoing on what Coco was saying that I, we as a board really try to use uh, DRC as a moment to educate. And what I really wanted to impress is that when we're going through this case, I still wanted to ensure that we can share the photos that the inspector took while, while we're doing the case and so that people still have and still give it as an opportunity to educate. So um, as we move forward in this project, I hope we continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other remarks from the board? Okay, seeing none at this time, I'm now gonna move forward with public comments um, for items that are not on the agenda. Good morning, Fred Jones, Professional Beauty Federation of California. I just wanted to personally thank Coco for bringing a uh, small business perspective to the table and bringing rational and considerate uh, deliberations to all of your work. Um, you are a fine example um, of, I'm grateful for your appointment. Um, and you contributed to a very collegial uh, board. I think it's one of the best run boards in the Department of Consumer Affairs, and it's because of people like you. I also wanna recognize Tammy for her incredible diligence, the many reports that she put, put together um, she was kind of one of the point people on the industry advisory committee, which helped gather a number of state agencies uh, that were brought to the table, <coughs> which was pretty impressive given uh, the glacial speed of government and bureaucracies. Uh, she will be missed. I do not envy Christy <laughs> to try to find someone uh, for that position. So I wanna thank both of you for your service to our industry. Wendy Cochran, California Aesthetic Alliance. Um, Coco, I am so sad to see you go because no one else is gonna talk about typography <laughs> and laying things out and putting draft on, on copies so that people don't misunderstand that these are draft copies that aren't actually instituted into law and I appreciate your inclusiveness. Um, I fight on a lot of uh, forward battles and I am on your side whichever pronoun you wanna use. <laughs> Thank you very much, and you will be very, very missed. And Tammy, California Estheticians, Esthetician Advocacy wouldn't be what we are now, almost 4,000 members. Um, usually goes up and down quite considerably when I get an email from you. Um, when I get to say that the FDA has now said that henna brows are not allowed in the state of California, um, I get a lot of blocks, but without your knowledge and your openness and your communication, we wouldn't be teaching the estheticians in the field about being compliant in a manner that is clear and honest and is looking forward to the future. And so um, I've never ratted your name out in public. <laughs> um, yes, so you didn't, so people didn't figure out your email name. Um, but um, I, you were absolutely invaluable to our members and you will be missed and I'm sure whomever um, is next up will be just as fabulous as you are. Thank you very much. Hi, 
Hi, Rich Edges, San Mateo County. Tammy, anytime I called you, you could always answer my questions. You're an asset, and you're also an always smiling face. In fact, this board is very positive, uh, and I like that. I'm a positive person, and I found that positive people usually get things done, and Coco, you're always very positive, uh, and you're so bright. When you came on, you learned this stuff so quickly, and I really appreciate you, and California's loss is New York's gain. Thanks. Are there any other public comments at this time? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on to our next item on the agenda, and that is our executive officer's report, so I'm going to defer to Chrissy. Thank you. So, I just wanted to just start off my report by, I don't wanna cry, so. <laughs> I'm on camera, um, but I, Tammy was making me cry over here, so I did just wanna make a comment that Tammy has been a great asset, as you all know, to our office. She is, she, she worked on our Sunset Report that I think is one of our best ever that we've put forward, so um, she will be greatly missed. I'm not looking at her. <laughs> and Coco, you've been the best ever. You've been definitely our most active uh, assembly appointee, so it's been a joy, and you will you will be very much missed for just the work that you've put into the board and also your your friendship as well. So, good luck to both of you and good riddance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, before we get into the statistics of our actual numbers, which are in your packets under agenda item number five, I do have several items that I want to report on that kind of go along with our sunset and as well as some of the statistics that are in your packet today. Um, I did attend the National Interstate Conference just this, I think I've been traveling a lot over the last few weeks, so I wanna say it's been, I was in the office only for a few days before I came here. So we were in Seattle um, for two days. We met with all of, not all, there was 23 states that attended this year, which is kind of low. Um, I think there's other states are, facing problems with costs, so they couldn't send their executive directors. Hopefully next year the conference will be in Milwaukee, which is probably a little less expensive than Seattle, so hopefully more executive officers are able to attend. But we did have two full days of work with executive officers from 20 plus other states. It was very informative. We found out that many states that were in attendance are looking that's a lot of the same issues that we're looking at. We did have some states that have reduced their hours for cosmetology. Um, these are the states that were very high numbers. 2,100 hours have gone down to around the 15, 1,600 hours. Um, there, are a there are boards that are looking at the smaller license categories, which I thought was interesting. Um, a couple boards have created a lash license so that someone can just get a lash certificate and I, they are calling them certificates, not actual licenses, as well as the waxing certificate, which is in our sunset report. So I definitely felt like most of the boards that are participating in the conference are kind of moving in the same direction. Um, I, we had lots of conversations about what we call our PSP, the personal service permit. Every state calls it something different. Um, this the we talked a lot about the app companies that are out there. Um, no other states right now are doing any type of regulation with the actual app companies. They're most, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they're mostly going towards a method similar to ours, um, or even more restrictive to where it's um, limited to the number of, or to the type of service you're doing as in you have to actually apply to, on January 15th, I'm gonna be at this location. Um, obviously in California, we have the volumes that we wouldn't be able to maintain something like that, but the other states that have such small volumes um, are, are doing similar things like that, and they're all looking, every state that was, was there was definitely looking at some type of personal service permit license. Um, I met last week with the Division of Apprenticeship Standards to talk about apprenticeship programs in California. And that kind of goes into our Spanish pass rates. We found 
recently that if you if you did a report of all of our schools and apprenticeship programs that have the most Spanish pass rate test takers, the top five of the top five four are pr uh, apprentice programs. They are failing their test at a very very high rate. Apprentice programs are averaging around 20% pass rate. So when you take those large numbers into the entire scheme of things it's really impacting that Spanish pass rate. As this board had talked about previously, we are putting together a Spanish task force and we're hoping to do that by the end of, end of the year. Um, but the meeting went very well with Division of Apprenticeship Standards. We are going to be continuing to work with them. Hopefully they'll be able to be on our committee as well <coughs> to talk about this so that we can try to get some type of different types of regulations to um, help this situation. One of, one of the big concerns is you, we require a 10th grade education. And a lot of the schools have a process for very verifying that 10th grade education. And if they, they also have an ability to benefit test, well the apprenticeship programs don't have that. And we were at DRC recently and we had an appellant who came before us who explained to us that he could not read. He was an apprentice, he was a <coughs> licensed apprentice, and he openly admitted that he could not read, which there's no way he's going to pass the written test. So um, I think that's definitely where we need to kind of focus <coughs> our direction is on some apprenticeship reform, working with the DAS, um, we are giving them a lot of data, they're gonna be giving us some data, and so hopefully at the next board meeting, we'll have even more information on, on what we can do on the situation. I wanted to talk a little bit about outreach. We just met with the Department of Consumer Affairs, our um, public information officer, who is assigned to our board. And it's, um, he's new to DCA, and he comes from a past television reporter. So we're very excited, and we've asked that our first project be to talk about a consumer campaign. So we, over the next few weeks, will be putting that together. He has a lot of ideas. Um, but you know, we've been talking about trying to get a plan together, and I think he's going to be the perfect person to help us. Um, and so I think by the next board meeting, for sure, we will have a plan on what, we're, what we can do to reach consumers. Um, uh, you might remember last year we did a town hall meeting at the Mexican consulate in Los Angeles. They have actually invited us back. So there's a tentative date set for that of December 4th. We also talked to our representative with DCA to try to expand that to other consulates throughout um, California, so we're hoping to do that as well. We've also, with the help of Mr. Federico, and he's a little alarmed right now, um, have arranged a tour for some staff members at the Capitol. So coming up for sunset, we um, had talked about this, I had talked about this with some, the chief consultant for Assembly BMP, and they've gotten a lot of feedback of people that would wanna come, so we have a tentative date set for that. And Joe will, has been gracious enough to allow a tour to happen of his school to kind of give some of the people in the, that work on a lot of these bills a different perspective and see how things happen actually in a, a cosmetology school. Okay. Lastly, update on our school situation that we have. We, um, as I mentioned in our last meeting, and Dr. Marion from the Bureau of Private Post-Secondary reported as well, that we did do three emergency decisions on three very, very bad schools. But aside from that, we have eight schools that have now closed down because we have put so much pressure on their operations and their fraudulent proof of trainings that have come through. Eight. And that doesn't include the three that we're t we took an emergency decision on. These are eight schools that just one day disappeared. Um, so uh, it's huge. You will see a drop in our number of applications that we've processed, and we believe that is the reason. We stopped process. We formally denied. That's an actual formal denial 
over 400 applicants who received a, an a official denial. We gave, we gave these students a couple of opportunities. We, instead of denying them right from the beginning, we issued deficiency letters because, and, and allowed them to withdraw their applications. Because once you're formally denied, you have to wait a year before you reapply. So if you happen to be a manicurist, and these denials are across all, well not across all our license types, it's, it's Cosmo, Cosmo, Manny, and SD. The Cosmo course is 400 hours. So we've, you know, denying them and not letting them come back for a year is a pretty severe punishment for these individuals, some who absolutely knowingly bought hours and some who probably were misled by the schools. So we wanted to give all the opportunities we could for people to withdraw their applications, go to a legitimate school. And we, we did have a significant number of withdrawals that took place and we're still having them every day today. But we did formally deny over 400 so they will have to wait for a year to reapply. Um, we have had conference calls with NACUS now, the accrediting organization, because we are finding more and more schools that are accredited that we don't believe are teaching the curriculum that they were approved to teach. So two major issues that we have, the selling of hours, and then also just not teaching the right curriculum. Having students, we're, we, we're walking into schools where everybody does self-study. So there's no instruction going on at all. Um, and so we're working with NACUS as well. We've been sharing information with them. They've been sharing information with us. This is the first time ever that we've had any type of work that we've done with this organization, so we're very excited about that. Other states are working with us. Nevada board took a, just made a decision recently to no longer accept applications from our problem schools. Um, we have a list of schools that we have shared and <coughs> Obviously, it's a different, they have a different regulatory structure. That's not something we could do. Um, they have sole oversight of their schools, so their board actually voted to not accept applications from these closed, these eight closed schools that we have. And now I'm working with Arizona on the same aspect. That was also a huge topic in Seattle. Everyone is facing similar issues. And I actually am working with a couple other executive officers um, in the country to put together some certification information so that all of the states can get on the same page because now the huge issue is fraudulent certification letters. There, um, we had a huge stack of, of fake certification letters that one of the other executive officers shared with us as a sample. So people are faking certification letters and trying to get reciprocity. So, um, all of the, uh, we're all on board with that and we're looking, we, we think we have a good system in place to try to combat that, which is making sure we have direct contact with all of these other states and how we get and how we receive and how we send our certification letters. So that I think is gonna be really helpful. So other than that, <laughs> with this, um, our statistics look good. I, wanna, I wanted to make a comment about DRC that again, we continue to be extremely caught up. We're doing two days here in San Diego, and San Diego usually is one of the areas where we need at least three. I wanna thank all the board members for their work on that. It's been huge over the last several years. Um, and going into sunset with, with no backlog at DRC is a huge, a huge benefit to us. So, because it's just been notorious that we haven't been able to get caught up. Um, a, you know, it's, it all, they all, everything trickles down. We're issuing less licenses because we've caught the fraud. Um, and so it's, it's all just kind of evening out. I think we're going to see things change eventually once we get through this um, part, pat, you know, this area where we're taking such a strong stand on these schools and schools start knowing that we're not gonna tolerate it. So I think everything will even out. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have one, I have a couple. The, um, on our examination results, especially as we've been speaking about the uh, Spanish written exam results, 
and knowing that we're going to be doing a lot of work on that next year. Um, one quick question. How do we define the category Spanish? Is that self-defined by them on an application? Or? Yes, because the exam is offered in Spanish, Vietnamese, or Korean, applicants choose to take the test in those languages, and then this is pulled from our system for how they took that exam. Okay. So, so the written exam is translated into Spanish for them okay. and so forth. So they would be primarily, if not entirely, Spanish speakers? Yes. Naturally, okay. okay. One of the things that's interesting is when you do a report of, every, of where are all these applicants coming from, there's a lot of people that choose to take the exam in Spanish that did not have the education in Spanish and didn't go to a school that is approved to teach in Spanish because the Bureau approves schools to teach in those languages. So you'll see a lot of schools have one or two individuals that decided to take it in Spanish and didn't usually do well. And I know that um, you've been extremely busy, not only with the, uh, the report here, but also with the, the damn dailies that you have to do just to keep the operations going there. I know it's been crazy time there. I was wondering, is it possible perhaps by our next board meeting in February of next year. Could you develop a couple more statistics on, on a one-off basis, not to add to this report, but I think it might be give us, give us some more information on relative to the Spanish written pass rate. And, and there are two analytics I thought that would be interesting to us. One is, I know on the, on the scores that we're seeing here under written examination, they're blended scores, aren't they? Meaning I could see a first time test taker here or a fifth time test taker yes. inside there. Is it possible that you could give us um, a, uh, the average failing score under 75, whatever the average failing score is on the written test for first time only uh, Spanish written test takers. I mean, my question here is how close, uh, what I'm ultimately looking for, I think might be helpful for us next year, is how close are they coming? Are they missing by five points or are they missing by 40 points? Um, it would be interesting to know the percentage of them that fail by 10 points or less as a secondary thing. So I thought those statistics could help us next year. And two, um, what happens when they take the test twice, could they in fact by taking it twice have a, a reasonable pass rate all of a sudden? And I was thinking maybe we could look at the pass rates for Spanish test takers on their second time only taking the test. I mean maybe it was 40%, 30-40% that passed the first time but on the second time it's equally as high if not more being optimistic. Just to give us a what two tests could mean in a situation like this. And maybe just let us know in the examination results of the February mean, and, and don't, not a permanent basis, just some statistics to get us started for next year. We should be able to get that. Great, thanks. And that, um, I forgot actually to also mention that we do have right now um, within the DCA, our Office of Professional Examination Services is actually reaching out and talking to the test developers for the national exam to talk about the scoring methods to determine what, what we can, uh, to give us an option of what we can do that makes sure the practical prevails but still has a valid method for scoring. So that will also That's be wonderful. talked about at our next meeting. That's wonderful. So I have a question that I thought was kind of interesting. Why is it that on the written examination for Barber in Spanish, it's at 63%, but uh, written for Spanish in Cosmos at 31? There's 50 more questions on the Cosmo than the Barber. Uh, thank you. Question about um, our, uh, reviewing our licenses issued over the last five years. Um, I've noticed a significant increase year over year on the both apprenticeship and cosmetology apprentice, albeit last year I looked at cosmetology apprentice. 
is there has there also been an increase in apprentice programs that basically speak to that? Significant. Okay. Thank you. We'll add that to the report. Okay. So you can see that next at the next meeting. Appreciate that. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? <coughs> Okay, hey, thank you, Christy. So now we're gonna move on to our next item on the agenda, which is the approval of our board minutes. So if everyone can take an opportunity to look at the board minutes from our last meeting. And I'll need a motion to approve the minutes after your review. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Are there any public comments? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna vote, and I'll start to my right. Mr. Federico, aye. Holly Cardenas, aye. Coco Lachine, abstain. Dr. Carrie Williams, aye. Lisa Tong, yes. Steve Weeks, yes. Jackie Crabtree, yes. Andrew Drafkin, yes. Okay, the motion passes. The next item on our agenda um, are, proposed, are the proposed board meeting dates and locations for 2019. So has everyone had an opportunity to take a look at those upcoming dates for next year? And so if there are any questions or concerns at this time about the dates, it's good to me. I just wanna point out that May 12th is Mother's Day. <laughs> 12th is Mother's Day. So if that poses a problem for anyone, we'll address that. Any additional comments about the proposed? Mm -hmm. So, um, Sunday, November 3rd is the time change in 2019. So, just drop back a grade. <laughs> Any additional um, comments or information for our proposed meeting dates for next year? Can we move off that May 12th date? Or does that cause problems? Oh, no, we'll adjust it. We can push it back a week. I mean, these are tentative, so they're, it's just that we'd like to get them up so the public knows. Always a tentative. San Jose is always never tentative. never happens. <laughs> but darn it, we're gonna make it to San Jose this year. <laughs> okay, any additional um, comments regarding our proposed dates for 2019? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on to our exciting Sunset Review report. And at this meeting, we will need a final approval of our report. And again, I just wanna thank our staff for all of the hard work they did for pulling this report together. As Christy shared earlier, um, having been at the last Sunset Review, I'm really, really excited about, about this one. I'm going to defer to Christy. Okay. So before we get started, we did pass out one of the, the topics that came up at our last meeting. I can't believe it. Was adding a couple of new issues. So we, if you look at section 11, and I'm talking about the beautiful volume one, <laughs> um, we did add in volume one. On page 138, um, registration of students. So that is something that the board um, asked us to do at our last meeting, so we have that. And then we also did something a little different, and that is why it was handed out to you today. We have a new issue, issue number 12, which is internships. So this is, um, we talked about paying externs, we talked about trying to get students and schools out into salons quicker. Um, as we're gonna talk about in a little bit, our extern bill that allowed an expansion to barbers as well as into community colleges did pass. So that goes, that becomes effective January 1. So in talking with other states, a lot of other states do an internship program. So we wrote it that way to get this item to be talked about in Sunset. Um, I, this language is 
pretty much taken from the state of Utah, who has an internship program, and I've talked to their executive director as well as some of their board members, and they say it, it works very well for them. So it gets them out into the uh, salon quicker than an extern would. So it still maintains that externship program, which is an unpaid process, and community colleges will benefit. It's their first time being able to use the extern program. So in my opinion, we do something a little different, and we add an internship program so that it allows students, after a certain, certain amount of hours that they've completed, to go into the salon as a working person <coughs> and to gain that experience while they're in there and um, really shorten the kind of the amount of time they're actually spending in the school setting, but still be a student enrolled in a school. I personally um, would like this, especially if we had registration of students, because then we know that it's legitimate. Um, so I think they go hand in hand. But this is the direction that I am proposing that we go in one other avenue to try to get students into the workforce sooner. So then the internship and externship? Correct. So I would just make sure that um, the establishment criteria that you set out matches the same as it does. It does. Is it a required, is the internship required to be paid or is it an optional? Optional. So you can have an unpaid internship. Correct. I, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this. So as a, as an owner of a salon, would insurance cover an unlicensed person doing services for the oh, owner? I don't, I can't answer that, mm. but we, yeah, I can't answer that. Are there any additional questions at this time? About I do okay. think that if the board agrees with the concept that we go forward um, and we can certainly work out some of the details along the way um, when, if it gets accepted into legislation, um, there will be opportunities for us to try to fine tune those issues as well. But from a board perspective at sunset review time, I think it's a good option for us to to take on. Just one thing as a clarification. That, that in the background and justification for change, the last sentence there, it says that this the board proposes a paid internship program. So we are saying it is a paid internship program. We're not saying it's paid or unpaid. It's or, say so optional instead. I don't know if that's the intent or not, but that's what's being said. So we should clarify that just, because I don't think it's I mean, I'm, I'm all in favor of the paid internship. I'm not trying to unpay it. It's but not I just want to make sure that if, if our intention is to have a internship program, parenthesis, paid or unpaid, close parenthesis, <laughs> then we might want to be distinctive on that. Right, and we didn't, we didn't make it specific in the language, so we can clarify that in the background, paid or unpaid. If that's what the board thinks, I mean. I would like to be paid, personally. I agree, it should be optional. Optional. So we disagree. Or you agree with I, her? Yeah, I think it okay. needs to be clarified. Are there any additional questions or comments at this time? Oh, from the board? I'm not public yet. <laughs> okay, seeing none. And this is for um, the entire sunset review before we get a motion, because we do need to approve our sunset review. Oh. I'm sorry, I just want to add one more thing to that, because I think if we clarify if it's paid or unpaid, then we're looking at, um, you know, labor board, you know, issues with the, with labor laws. So, you know, just to keep the salon owner covered. I think there are very specific um, requirements around internships under California labor law. So they either have to, it either has to be 
um, with accredited school. So I'm not entirely clear on how that works for this particular industry. Um, but students either need to get credit from the school um, or be paid, I think, are the two kind of parameters for it. So and just so you know, we are recommending that this only be for accredited schools. Sure. Um, I personally feel strongly about that, considering what we have come across in school situation. For um, externs is a, is a small number of hours, and this would be an, an increase in the number of hours. And accredited schools do have to follow a lot more requirements than non-accredited. And this, that's open to the board for discussion, but my personal opinion is it should be limited to accredited schools, and that's how we have it written. question and I guess the point will this need to be included separately from rest of the packet to be included or just can we approve the packet as one thing the latter thank you any additional questions comments um, sorry I'm beating a dead horse here but um, under outcome desired it also says that provide an opportunity to for students to earn a wage and obtain on the job training Maybe it should be and or obtained if we want to make it unpaid. Okay. Thank you. And then in throughout the sunset report, we've made um, significant cleanup language um, that was discussed at our last board meeting. And then I would ask that when a motion is made that you allow myself to make any non-substantial changes because no matter how many times we look at this, we are still finding typos and odd things. That, so um, we would want that ability to not have to come back to the board. And this is due to the legislature December 1st. I have two small questions on the uh, Sunset Review Report. On the uh, Three page summary up front. I think that's a great idea at uh, the uh, volume one. The, I think obviously that's a great idea. But I'm questioning the one, two, three, fourth paragraph down, the last sentence the cost of education in this industry can range from 2500 to 19000 with the average cost of a private college being approximately 15000 for a cosmetology course. I'm just wondering, since this is going to be primarily directed at people that aren't familiar with our industry, maybe we should put some sort of a, uh, 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 so they don't think it's one course, two courses, or three courses, can we somehow reference the 1,600 hours involved in our definition of course? Sure. Yeah. And um, the second thing was, I, I didn't see, but I'm, I'm sure we, we did, we talked about it last meeting, to um, define PSP to eliminate any connection, any possible connection to the establishment license. Did we mention that in this revision? No, we did not. The definition of PSP is in statute, and so that's why we did not mention it. Can we go the other direction and somehow mention from the establishment side that uh, as an establishment, you shall not, you know. Where would we put that? In our executive summary? May, uh, no, 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 I mean in the actual report itself, somewhere we talk about PSPs. I'm just worried about if a PSP can operate as, as a business, which they will be an individual business, they can have an office. Right. And I'm worried about that office turning into an establishment oh, later. We are, we are, we made that part of the regulations. So it's going to be part of our, of our regulations for the PSP. I don't personally think it should be here. Okay. And how do we pass the regulations and what's their time frame on that? So the board approved the regulations at the last meeting. Right. And with those, with, with those, those suggestions, yes. Okay. So those, um, our staff is working on the regulatory package right now that we'll be submitting to legal probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, but that is happening on like a separate track. 
as long as it's covered. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Any additional questions or comments before we establish a motion? Okay, seeing none, then I would ask for a motion to approve our sunset report with the note to allow our executive officer to make non substitute substitute. You know what I'm trying to say. Change. I would like to make that motion, including the non substantial. <laughs> now I'm <laughs> I'll second. Okay, so we do have a motion on the floor now. Open up to public comment. Hello, uh, Caroline Barboza, Barboza Barber Academy. And I was wondering how many hours would be required to complete uh, before the intern externship program would take over? I think it says 800. No? Yeah, we have 800 listed in the and current. Just for the record, I just want to uh, suggest that you do only uh, um, let allow accredited schools. Ivy, Miami, industry, Western Mass, Long Beach, something good happens because I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Kudos again on a good sunset report. I've been through many of them. This one's a very good one. Thank you. I do appreciate all the comments I've heard and the little changes and edits. I would have to say this though, on the internship, which I'm very much in favor of, but I think it should be paid. And I'll tell you why. When someone is offering something of value to an employer that brings that employer value, to value their work, they should be compensated for it. And I'll go one step farther. As my good friend, Fred Jones says, this is a $9 billion industry, but only one billion of it is reported. So that should tell you right away that there may be someone playing fast and loose with these internship programs. So I hate to see young people starting out and after a number of months feeling like they've been used. So it could be a minimum wage or anything above it that the employer wants to grant and they should be covered by workman's comp insurance in case they're injured. Thank you. Wendy Cochran, California Aesthetic Alliance. I agree with the uh, paid part of the internship because the majority of the conversations that I have in my group um, are about unfair labor practices, almost more than talking about aesthetics and things that are going on in the industry. We still have non-compliance on a large uh, uh, percentage of our, of our employees, at least I'll, I'll speak for the estheticians. Um, people are still working on commission, and they don't know it because they don't know it. The schools aren't teaching it, and so if they get into these intern positions, I think that it's going to continue to roll into a position where they know that they weren't paid at school, so it's okay that they're paid, you know, they're paid under the table, they're paid cash, they're paid per service, and things like that, because it starts at the schools, and that's really an important foundation to establish. Um, Christy, would you like me to give you my typography question, or my, um, my those comments? Love it. Okay, because you do have um, mechanic brushes in, and I didn't know what mechanic brushes were other than what my dad would have used. <laughs> um, so if I could contribute a small email about that the would be words of the devices and things like that. I also know she, uh, last time we had Mrs. Uh, Edmonton from ASCP requesting that we be able to do dermaplaning. And if I am reading into section, let's see what page we're on, page 162 of your PDF, uh, I think on uh, 126 of the printed version of it, um, we have under removing of hair, uh, thank you for adding sugaring. And uh, devices or appliances of any kind or description, except for the light waves thing. Is that to understand that that would mean um, a mechanical device like a dermaflash, which is, a, is a, a vibrating hand tool that we use for uh, removing peach fuzz? Um, is that also to mean that we could, and, and there, the market is now getting flooded with those hand tools? 
for removing peach fuzz from the face, which is interesting to note because um, a lot of people cannot tolerate waxing and removal of hair from the face. Um, it's a very aggressive manner of removing hair from the face for some people. So Schick has got one, Dermaflash has got one, and then there's all sorts of uh, devices that are coming in on the market that have a single-use disposable razor that they're supposed to be single-use. If they're you know used by the consumers, they usually aren't. Um, but those, that would probably fit in that category in there. If the intent is for hair removal. Okay, so if their entire marketing campaign and branding is for hair removal, then they should be able to use this device in a professional treatment by a licensed esthetician. Okay. And then dermaplaning, is that not considered part of the hair removal or is that considered exfoliation process by the board? I die, I die. Okay, fine. Um, okay, thank you very much. And I will send you some of the uh, mechanic things. And, and um, were you going to also address uh, the plasma and the fibroblast? Address it in sunset? Yes, yeah. okay. As part of the trending thing, there was like new trends in one of the sections, no? Not within our scope. I agree, okay, thank you. Amy Strabeck, Precision Nails. Um, I just want to point out that we have only devoted 27 words to describe the scope of practice for manicuring. And we know that this is one of our big problem areas. And I know that in this new version, the word beautifying has been removed. When you take the word beautifying out and you leave words like manicuring and pedicuring in, what you're doing unintentionally, Fred Jones, is perhaps suggesting that applying extensions and decorating the nails with rhinestones or nail art would not necessarily be licensed required. So that concerns me. Um, I gave you a whole list of different verbs you could use to describe uh, the use of enhancement products last time. So decorating, <coughs> enhancing, whatever. I think there needs to be an expansion of this so that people don't think that this doesn't apply to them when they're using acrylic products, gel products, nail art, that sort of thing. I'd also like to encourage you to replace the word tonics with products on page 124 because it sounds so old timey. Hello, it's 2018. I don't think people talk about tonics unless they're trying to be retro. And you know, no one's traveling around. I don't know, anyway. Um, I would like that removed. Um, and also, I would like to encourage going forward, um, particularly with the um, pending approval of any sort of PSP, is that we require that all licensees and establishments advertise and conduct their businesses with their legal names and with their license numbers. Because what good is it if we make all of these requirements either for doing services within an establishment or doing them mobile if we do not require them to advertise and promote themselves with information that consumers could actually look up on the website. Because right now we don't have that. Uh, we can't look it up by location, certainly. It's just we're using people's names and their business names to try to look them up and see if they're in fact licensed. And our hands are tied if we don't enforce some sort of accountability to have them use their legal names and their license numbers. So thank you. Drew Henderson, uh, San Diego City College, Department of Cosmetology and Faculty. Um, I wanted to thank, um, on behalf of my colleagues and my students present today at this meeting, my department chair, Sudi Phillips, um, my dean, uh, Rose Lamoralia, um, to thank the board for approving um, our department to have the barbering conversion program. Uh, we very much appreciate everything that was involved in that. Um, also wanted to encourage and really thank the board for including in the Sunset Report the, the portion on internship and externship. Um, 
We've, we've waited for this for so long, and we have a number of different uh, opportunities that are always available to us, but we're, we're trying to toe the line and just wait for that formal approval. Um, I, there was only one comment uh, I just wanted to make, or possibly a question, um, how that uh, internship and externship would affect um, radio, TV, film, uh, in terms of um, guild, uh, Screen Actors Guild, or, or what might apply uh, when it comes to students that would be doing those programs and in film projects, um, television projects, radio projects, where they would be doing services um, as it crosses over into that um, field. Hello. There is currently an exemption in the law for uh, licensees who work in film and television. So it wouldn't impact those individuals who are on movie sets, television sets, those type of environments. Excellent, and, and that goes for, because uh, the other question about the insurance, that one is what rang the bell for me because um, we, we do currently have like a, a film project that's here locally and our students actually have participated in doing hair and makeup um, with that project and uh, the insurance uh, question was something that when it was brought up it was, it was interesting for me to know. Was that a union project? It was, it's um, SAG, um, but it was unpaid, and it was not, um, it was not for hours. It was not to be accredited to hours for the student's education. So I know we don't regulate the film industry. So Christy, is there any additional information he should know? Because I know we don't have any regulations for that, for the movie and television industry. No, because they're exempt. Yeah, so. Thank you so much. Morning again, Fred Jones, Professional Beauty Federation of California. This is a heck of a report, and it's a heck of a report because you're a heck of a board with great staff that have done a heck of a lot of work. See, I didn't say H E double hockey sticks because I'm in public. Um, it's it seriously is impressive. Uh, the problem when you're dealing with uh, the legislature is nobody reads, so I think it's wise that you have kind of an executive summary. Uh, from your president and vice president in those three pages. Um, just on wordsmithing, you do mention the language access protocol twice, <coughs> in paragraph one and two, and that's pretty valuable real estate, so you might want to reconsider mentioning it twice on your first two bullets uh, on the second page of the letter. On the internship, uh, as long as you have an internship and an externship, I think it's o appropriate um, to set a higher bar for the internship, the optional pay for accredited schools. Uh, my organization would have balked if you were trying to limit either or both of those, or both of those programs to just accredited schools. We think all schools should have an opportunity to help their kids uh, get into a salon uh, as soon as possible. And obviously uh, there's a huge effort, it's a nationwide effort, to go after licenses uh, using the argument of barriers to entry. Uh, you as a board license over 1% of every Californian in the state. And that includes men, women, and children. <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure what our legislature is trying to respond to because if there are barriers, obviously you have not done a good job <laughs> erecting those barriers. Uh, 625,000 individuals are licensed by this board. That's a huge number. Um, that, that's more than some state's total population. <laughs> Just to add some perspective. The idea of optional pay is important from my association's vantage point because salons like Jackie's may not take advantage of an internship if they're forced to pay them. So let's get this going Let's get as many salons participating, and then maybe we can revisit you know, the mandatory pay issue. But our concern is just getting the internship going um, and bringing as many salons into it as possible. Um, and I can just tell you from uh, the schools that I've talked to, 
if you require it to be paid, there just won't be that many salons that will take advantage of it. And, and frankly, a salon should be given an opportunity to try out an intern and see how effective and good they are before you force their hand uh, to pay them. But giving them that opportunity to earn while they learn is a great response to the barrier to entry argument that's being used against us in the legislature. And as Ms. Tong has already pointed out, they are receiving compensation even if they're not receiving monetary compensation, and that is clock hour credit. So um, that gets them around some of these labor issue concerns, but it also is a matter of fairness. So these students will not only be provided real world experience outside of their school clinic floor, but in a real salon, not only provide them an opportunity to prove themselves to their potential future employer, but they will be given clock hour credit for it. So that all will happen. In addition to that, if the salon so chooses, they'll be able to pay them. So I think it's a great, fair, uh, and responsible approach. And limiting that right now to knock us accredited schools, given our history with some fraudulent schools, is probably wise. The enrollment registration is fantastic. That, that is going to overnight stop this selling the Ballers phenomenon. Although, because of Ms. Underwood's work, um, that's already started. 11 schools, that's just amazing. Uh, I mean, that, that's, you buried the lead. <laughs> you should have started the meeting with that announcement. Good riddance to all of those fraudulent schools who have been undermining the integrity of our license. Um, I would have suggested it's too late to uh, get into uh, nitpicking the letter, but maybe an embrace of the fact that you have struggled with the PSP for years since this law was passed. And you struggled for all the right reasons. Um, you're trying to protect the integrity of the license. You're trying to protect the integrity of your inspection protocols. And at the end of the day, trying to protect consumers. And a wild, wild west perspective where people could be doing these services anytime, anywhere, with no possibility of inspections is a scary proposition for your board, and it should be a scary proposition for your board, and you should do your due diligence before you promulgate any permit uh, to do this. And that's exactly what you've done. So I would have preferred you had some language in that letter saying, look, we have struggled with this. We acknowledge this. And I'll tell you, one of the co-chairs of the Sunset Review Committee, this is his number one issue. His chief of staff appeared before this board to call out this issue. Well, embrace it. Embrace that, yes, you haven't been foot dragging. You've had numerous meetings, both full board meetings, committee meetings, industry advisory committees on this issue. And you've had a lot of input, input from industry. And you've been doing your due diligence. I think acknowledging that in the letter might be helpful also because the letter sounds a little bit too much cheerleading. <laughs> and so acknowledging a little bit of uh, delay in something may also add a little bit more um, credibility. But I think the report is phenomenal and it's phenomenal because this board has been doing phenomenal work. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Cochran, um, California Aesthetic Alliance. Um, I would agree with mentioning deregulation because there is a popular groundswell of podcasts and online uh, Zoom trainings and things like that from business consultants that start off their emails out to their, their blasts that say, what's wrong with deregulation? Let's all get together and talk about it. Because they see if, if they are being approached by these outside agencies that are saying, well, why do we really need a license? I mean, you could do anything you wanted. You wouldn't be fined. You wouldn't be held to any standard. You could go to somebody's house. Be no problem. They're leading with podcasts. They're leading with Zoom meetings and things like that that are saying, yeah, deregulation is not such a bad thing. So that is in the popular culture right now because I've gotten several emails over the last couple of months that have led off with that sort of statement. And also to support Jamie's uh, position on uh, businesses and establishment licenses being mentioned the same way is going to help you from a consumer standpoint because if I go to 
fabulous day spa, as it says on the marquee outside, and the establishment license has been issued under John Smith's day spa, they can't make those reports when they need to. So they aren't, they just go, okay, well, forget it. I don't care if I have an infected eyebrow right now. And that happens a lot. That also happens to your licensees when they try and say, okay, I work for Bat Fabulous Day Spa, and this is the establishment. And then the DIR comes in and says, there's no such thing as Fabulous Day Spa, so we don't know who to go after. And then, you know, two hours worth of waiting on hold, these cases get blown off by the DIR, and they also get blown off by the licensee. And it's not correcting any of the problems. Because there's no way to cross-reference in the California Breeze system, you know, Fabulous Day Spot is the same entity as John Smith LLC. So um, that's something really to consider because it is kind of like a, a cloaked thing that's in the industry that, you know, that's easy for people to blow off. So you are missing out consumer reports because they can't figure out what the establishment name is and you're missing out, um, you know, actual uh, uh, employment situations that are trying to be corrected. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional public comments at this time, specific to our sunset review? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna call, oh, we I have one more thing I wanna add to that. It's not, you know, as far as the uh, internship on being paid or not being paid, it's not that I'm say, stating that the um, intern should be taken advantage of and not being paid. I'm just looking out for the salon owner who is bringing in somebody who isn't qualified to not be doing, you know, good service. In my salon, I wouldn't want somebody doing services on my clientele with not a lot of um, education at that point, and then that guest paying for a mediocre service. So that's why I wanted the option in there because I'm a more high-end salon and I would want more you know, educated individuals getting services with correct um, service providers. I apologize, but I would like to amend my um, original. Can I have a couple comments Please. before you Please. amend it? Um, because I would like to clarify a couple things from the public comments that I think the board should consider. I do think um, Ms. Schraubeck mentioned adding beautification, I believe, back into and I would agree with that. Um, so that would be one recommendation I would make to your amended motion. And I would also agree if the board has enough faith in me, because we have, I do have a limited time that you amend the motion of the executive summary to include a brief synopsis of the PSP of what the board has done. I think that's a great idea to make those two additional amendments as well as just one simple one, which is under your recommended language for the internship, you have um, the student shall have completed a minimum of 800 hours in the approved school in the course of barbering or cosmetology. That actually, I, I believe you should just change it to 50% of the prescribed course rather than 800 hours since there's two different hour regulate requirements for cosmetology and barbering. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Eric, before we take a vote, can I just make one more comment? Yes, of course. That? Um, I'm kind of, I mean, if the in, I'm questioning what is the actual intent, because, you know, as I kind of disagree with Fred saying, let's let it go with paid and under, unpaid, and then after we get it up and running, then maybe convert it to paid. I think the arguments are going to be then, oh, now you're going to stunt the growth of the, if we're making it paid, we're going to lose a lot of people that only want to be unpaid. I think if we go with one decision, it's what it's going to be. It's going to be hard to change, you know, tracks later on. The other thing is, is that if I'm paying my tuition to a school, and then that, then I thought this was an opportunity for me to earn a living while in school, but I'm not able to do that. I'm now, I don't. The school's taking my my, my money. They're not having to provide the extra hours because I'm earning those hours for somebody else who's getting paid for that. I don't see where the better, I mean, besides, you know, learning what to do, that's great. But in my, you know, my job, to a certain extent, I've learned the ropes within the first, 
you know, a week or two and then you're off and running. Now we're gonna make them wait another 800 hours or so of you know, providing that unpaid labor to another facility. I just, and meanwhile I'm paying somebody else for that. I mean, I know I'm getting my hours, but they're not, the, the school's not doing anything to, to earn the, that money for those hours. And I'm earning something else for somebody else. I just, I'm having a hard time grasping with, dealing with that. So I'd like to add to that. Okay, I don't know the specific parameters of internships, but I actually think there's a very like clear definition of internships in terms of California labor law, and I think we really need to check that before we move any language forward to make sure that it aligns. Because I I do know that from at least a, like a business standpoint for normal businesses that hire internships through HR practice, there are very specific parameters of what an intern can or cannot do. And there's only two ways of being able to legally host an intern. And so I feel like a lot of our conversation right now is maybe due to a, a lack of clear definition on what the internship actually means um, or, or is, is what those parameters should be um, clearly for the industry because I know for a fact that for small businesses who hire interns, interns cannot replace the labor of any particular um, hired person or employee. So there's, it, it has to be a learning opportunity. Um, and if there is any kind of overstep in what an intern is doing that could be classified as what an employee can do, you're breaking labor law. Um, and I know that for sure for, for small business um, from HR um, rules. But I don't know what the clear language is around that. Um, and I do know that to, to host an intern, you must either pay minimum wage or you must work with the school that is providing the intern to provide um, course credit for that student. So I understand your point, but before we like get too far into um, you know, deciding that interns, if they are paid um, or not, I think we also need to clarify um, what interns can or cannot actually do for business owners who decide to take interns in. Because I don't think interns should ever replace any kind of labor to Jackie's point, they right. don't have enough experience. So internships are supposed to be learning experiences. Um, and I do think it is a good way for students to get a different kind of experience that could potentially also be paid. Um, because to your point, they are paying a school for coursework, um, but it's really going to be up to the school and whoever hires the intern to determine whether or not the hours that are provided within the internship would replace any specific coursework that the school would provide. So that type of specific technical work, I'm very unclear on. Um, and I think we probably need to find some clarification for that before we put this into the industry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hold on one second. We have a motion on the floor, but we didn't get a second for the amended motion. So, I Just clarify the motion. Yes, the motion right now is to approve the sunset review report with any non-substantial changes to be made by the executive officer, with the inclusion of beautification back into the manicure scope of practice, as well as adding a brief summary of what the board has done on the PSP into the executive summary. And at this point, we are including issue number 12 internships with the change that it is paid or unpaid. That is how I see the motion right now happening. So correct me if I'm wrong. And that, that was your and motion. And I'm sorry, right? and 50% of the hours required. Well, I will second that motion. Is there any additional um, questions or comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, um, public comment. Thank you. I'm Yvonne Villalobos, and I'm here as a business owner and an independent contractor as well. I have a couple of questions regarding the um, intern externship program. 
And uh, my questions are all related to, uh, because I think we're all on the same page as far as wanting to support the industry as much as possible. Um, how, how will these uh, programs be regulated, for instance, the educators, the facilitators, or the sponsors being the salon owners who are going to be um, sponsoring some of these students, how are they going to be regulated? Um, and you know, let's talk about dilution, right? There's a lot of dilution when it comes to pass or fail. Um, so I'm interested to know, as far as like the internship programs, currently what are the percentage rates of success uh, with some of these programs? How many students are actually uh, passing with are you speaking specifically to the internships? Yes. So, so this is proposed. This isn't something that's happening right now. This is something that's proposed that we're including in our sunset review. So the details around how the internship programs are working, we haven't actually solidified that yet. So this is just conversation about what we're <coughs> just conversation about what we're proposing. But this the internships have not been implemented. And what currently yet. exists is the externship program which occurs after a student has completed 60% of their education, and that only allows them to basically attend one day a week inside of a salon basically to observe. And how are you actually monitoring the salon owners or the, right, the sponsors who are, how are you regulating to make sure that these students are properly being educated alongside what the schools are educating? We do have information about externships at this time because we're specifically <coughs> um, speaking to the motion that's on the floor regarding the approval of our sunset review report. Um, I would advise that um, there is information on our board website and um, maybe after the board meeting you can get some assistance with getting more information on the externships specifically. But this moment right now in the meeting is comments regarding the sunset review. So I know you have specific questions regarding externs. Um, but we don't have that information for you right now in detail to answer for you, okay? Okay, thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, Fred Jones, PBFC. So in law right now, uh, for the externship program, there's a phrase that says, prior to placement of the extern, the establishment shall agree in writing sent to the school and to all affected licensees that no reduction or alteration of any licensee's current work schedule shall occur. So that is a requirement built into the law for externship. You certainly can do it for internship. This is a proposal that's going to go at the front end of the legislative sausage mill. God only knows what it'll look, at, <laughs> look like at the end of the sausage mill. Uh, but I would certainly encourage the board to move forward today with this language. Because um, believe me, any bill that's introduced, they're not going to just take what Miss Underwood writes and pass that. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of churning. I'm sorry, Miss <laughs> Underwood, to admit that in public. <coughs> and again, I just wanted to reiterate, SB 999 would have allowed anybody to come in and do shampooing and hairstyling in every salon. And that bill passed with 32 yes votes out of a house of 40 in our state senate so if you're worried about the quality of interns who are in school and are heading toward licensure i think you've got your priorities screwed up we need to save our license and this is one of the ways of saving your board thank you thank you is there any additional public comment Okay, seeing none at this time, we're going, I'm going to call for a vote, and I'll start to my, oh, you I have a question? I request that yes. you start the vote from the right. I will start the vote from the right. <laughs> Always with the right. Joseph Federico, aye. Holly Corden is aye. Coco Lashin, yes. Dr. Carrie Williams, yes. Lisa Tong, yes. Steve Weeks, yes. Jackie Crabtree, yes. Andrew Drapkin, abstain. Okay, so at this moment, we're going to take a quick um, recess or break for about five minutes and we'll get um, we'll come back and finish with our agenda
Thank you. We're going to proceed with the next item on our agenda, which is item number nine, and it's the report from our Health and Safety Advisory Committee um, with details on the Dynamex decision. <coughs> so in your agenda packets is our minutes from our last Health and Safety Advisory Committee where we had quite the discussion on the Dynamics decision, which of course addresses independent contractors. Um, so we have provided this information. Um, we're not much further than we have been in the past. Um, lots of different agencies you know, are discussing it. I recently talked to someone at the Department of Industrial Relations and they are trying to come out with a statement that hopefully we could link to on our website so that we can provide information. Um, right now we are still getting calls and questions and we are referring them um, to their labor commissioner's office. So um, we wanted to provide these minutes because it did provide so much discussion that was, ha that was held at our Health and Safety Advisory Committee meeting. Um, I do think that once the legislative session starts, we will see lots of legislators coming up with some bills to talk about this decision, but until then, it's um, still kind of unclear. Are there, are there any questions or comments about the meeting notes from the advisory committee? You know, I went through this and read it all, and um, it's so true. I mean, it's just so many different people, like EDD's here, DIR's here, the labor commissioner's here, so it'll be interesting to see how this all um, plays out. But I, I, I really liked um, reading through this and seeing all the different information, especially here how EDD says that, broken down by industry, that the care industry um, is high in the complaints for employees. Uh, being violated. Any additional comments or questions? Do we need to approve the minutes? No, okay. So we're going to move on to our next item on the agenda, um, which is our legislative update, and we have some discussion and possible action on proposed bills. So there's no action needed. Oh, this awesome. is just an update on what has happened. I will just go through these quickly. AB 2134, which is our extern bill that allowed um, barbers as well as community colleges was, was chaptered and signed into law on September 24th, 2018. It'll be effective January 1, 2019. AB 2138, denial of applications that we had extensive discussions <coughs> over at this board was also signed with an implementation date of July 1, 2020. However, that bill was amended prior to it being signed, which we talked about at our last meeting, which still allows us to ask the question. So this bill impact <coughs> is much better than it was when it first started. Um, AB 2775, which is professional cosmetic labeling requirements, that bill was signed and is effective January 1, 2019. SB 984, which is board representation um, for women. That bill did not move out of the assembly. Um, and SB 1492, which was some cleanup language of ours. Um, uh, that was Senator Hill's bill. That, that was chaptered and becomes effective January 1. Again, there's not an implementation that we would need to do. It was just cleanup that we had asked for. That's it. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which are our proposed regulations, um, discussion and possible action. On this as well, we will not need any action today, but we wanted to just give a brief update and um, basically they're all in process. <laughs> um, I think we'll have a lot more updates at our next meeting, but we are working with DCA Legal on fine tuning some of our packages um, to get those formally noticed with the Office of Administrative Law, and so hopefully we will have more updates at our next meeting. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, so now we're gonna move on to item number 12, which are agenda items for the next <coughs> meeting. So um, do any of my fellow board members have any agenda items they would like to see on the next board meeting? Christy, I thought we talked about 
doing something, some kind of discussion about apps. I know I asked for it at this meeting, and I know we decided not to do it because you were just going to report back from NIC about what they were talking about. But is there something that we can put on a, to discuss or, you know, you know some, I'm trying to think of the less formal thing than discuss, uh, you know. And, and what would you want to discuss? That's the problem. I, I'm trying to refer back to what I was talking about at the last meeting. And well, in the last meeting we talked about regulating the apps. Um, I think that's a huge undertaking in the year 2019, 2020, <laughs> during our sunset. Um, but it's the pleasure of the board. We will do whatever you would like. <laughs> I don't think, I don't know if I was really thinking about regulating them. I was thinking about more of a discussion about what to do and whether regulation is something for us to consider or or work with. Uh, you know, someone was suggesting, I think it was a public comment, comment, starting our own app, and I thought that was, you know, not possible. But but I think I think it's just like a discussion on re the relationship between the board and the, the app industry Kind of a thing, and how how to deal with the issues that are going to arise, and whether the. Uh, but now that I'm thinking about it, I think we did send it to a committee. So never mind. I thought I said I wasn't going to talk today. <laughs> um, are there any agenda items there? I have uh, something I'd like to throw on. I don't know if it's going to be for this meeting or maybe the next. I know you know you have a giant undertaking with with Sunset, but. Um, I feel like that we constantly need to be um, on guard in regards to the, the deregulation that's coming around the corner. And I feel like one of the national trends that we may want to look at is a competency-based education and seeing kind of if there's anything else the, anything else out there in the nation that where people are participating in some style of competency-based education where you're basically more delivering skills than, than teaching you a test. Any additional agenda items? Um, I'd actually like to get kind of, and it could just be a one-sheeter, it may not need to be an agenda item, but um, just stats on our trans, um, translations or, or, or certified um, translator use at DRC, just looking at some numbers um, in terms of how many people have been accessing that service, um, but also like to see some numbers on who's using, um, how many remote um, translators we've utilized when we do our inspections um, just to see whether or not people are using it, whether or not we need to do a little bit more outreach to let people know that that's an option for them. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, seeing none, we're now going to, we actually have to go into closed session. So, so the members that are did not receive a packet will have to not participate in the closed session. And then will we come back in for me to close out the meeting? Yeah. My favorite. That's, well, that's why I stayed last night, because we had that thing last year on this meeting. I was at the meeting. So they were just like, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to go outside. I'm going to come back in and go out. Like, literally, I showed up, and they were like, we have all these cool notes for the statistics. And I'm like, well, that goes away. And then, like, we were like, yeah, that's okay. Some closed session. And now I'm going to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.